Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Auzu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa halul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Thank you for inviting me into your space today. I'm especially thankful to Brother Osama and my beautiful sweet niece Shabana for reaching out to me for this event. Today, I would, like to, I would like to share with you my perceptions and perspectives and reflections on the topic of faith and building an individual connection to Allah. I must forewarn you that my presentation will not take the most direct route. I intend to take you on a scenic tour that may at times digress and diverge from the main topic. But bear with me. I hope to make it worth your while. What is faith? More than 30 years ago, I came across a definition of faith that continues to resonate with me even today. It goes something like this. Faith is walking blindfolded on the edge of a precipice, believing that you will not fall. But even if you do, you will grow wings and learn to fly. Let's consider and analyze this definition. I see it as two parts of a whole. The first part is walking blindfolded on the edge of a precipice, the edge of a steep, very steep cliff. The second part is believing that you will not fall, but that even if you do fall, you will grow wings and learn to fly. Walking blindfolded on the edge of a precipice, when you think about it, doesn't that pretty much sum up our existence on this earth? When we go to bed, do we really know if we are going to wake up the next morning? Are we even sure that after we breathe out in the given moment, that we will be granted the next breath? Yet, we continue to make our plans for the next moment, the next day, the next month, the, year, the next year. Now consider this scenario. In the morning, you receive a text from a friend, a business colleague, a client that says, can we schedule a phone call for this evening? You check your calendar and you see that six o'clock that evening works for you. So you schedule the call for 6 p.m. that evening. You've checked your calendar. 6 p.m. works for both of you. So you take it as a given that the call will happen. You take it for granted. We generally tend to take these things for granted. Do we stop to consider any of the circumstances that may cause the call not to take place? I would say most of the time we do not. So here we are, walking on the edge of the precipice, completely oblivious, completely unaware that at any given step, we may go hurtling down the edge of the cliff. Now comes the second part of this equation, believing that you will not fall. Wait a minute, you say to me. When I scheduled the call and fully expected that it would happen, isn't that the same as believing that I will not fall? My response would be, yes. You believe that you would not fall because you did not even know that you were walking blindfolded on the edge of the precipice. You were not even aware that there was a sheer drop below you, that you could fall into it with the smallest misstep. You did not even know that there was a fall waiting to happen. You were simply blindfolded without any idea of where you were or where you were headed. You were only operating under the delusion that you could see clearly and that you had everything under control. To actually believe that you will not fall is to acknowledge the very real possibility that you could indeed fall. So you say to me, okay, now what? You have acknowledged the possibility that you could fall. Your call is scheduled for 6 p.m. You have it on your calendar. You've set your notification alarm. But now there is a voice in your head that says, hey, Despite all your preparation, this call may not happen. 
How do you move forward? How do you not freeze in place from fear of all the pitfalls that are waiting to occur between the time that you schedule the call to the time that it actually happens? How do you believe that you will not fall? One simple word, a little word that is so huge, it encapsulates the essence of every declaration of faith. What is that little word which is so small and yet so big? It is inshallah. Inshallah, God willing. If Allah wills it, it will happen. How big is this little word inshallah? That despite being aware of the pitfalls and the uncertainties, despite being aware of all the things that could go sideways, it holds you up. It allows you to move forward. It supports the weight of all those uncertainties. One tiny little word does all that. And it goes even beyond supporting the weight of all the uncertainties. It spreads out a safety net for you below the treacherous precipice. It tells you, even if you do fall, it will be because of Allah's will. So do not worry. He will take care of you. He will hold you up. He will let you grow wings and teach you to fly. It gives you the confidence, the absolute certainty that even if the call that you schedule, the call that may have been so important to your personal relationship, to your career, to closing the deal, even if that call does not happen, you will be okay. You will be fine. This is faith. This is what we can all aspire to. This is what we can all achieve. I repeat, this is what we can achieve. I think some of you are saying, what the heck is she talking about? Achieve faith, easier said than done. Yes, it is easier said, but I am here to tell you, to assert most emphatically that it can be done. We who have accepted Islam are fortunate that we have the words and message of Allah to guide us in every aspect, in every contingency in our lives. If you believe that the Quran is Allah speaking to mankind, speaking to you and me as individuals, and on some level, you must believe or else you would not be here then you must, you must, you must believe him when he says, as he does in Surah Qaf, chapter 50, ayat 16. Indeed, it is we who created humankind and fully know what their souls whisper to them. And we are closer to them than their jugular vein. In Surah Talaq, chapter 65, ayat 3, Allah tells us, and whoever puts their trust in Allah, then he alone is sufficient for them. Wow, he knows what our souls whisper to us. Even when we are deaf to the whisper of our souls, he hears it. He is closer to us than our jugular vein, the vein that carries blood back to our hearts to cleanse it and purify it and reoxygenate it so that we can continue to function. He is closer to us than that very life-enabling blood vessel. Now, indulge me for a moment. Hold your fingers up to your neck and try to feel your jugular. Then say to yourself, he is closer to me than this. Say it and believe it. Believe it, because if you believe the Quran is indeed his message to you, then he is indeed closer to you than the throbbing vein you feel under your fingers at this moment. And put your trust in him. Believe in him when he tells you that he alone is sufficient for you. Put your trust in him. He alone is sufficient for you. Do it. Do it. Do it. Make that leap of faith. As I said before, we are fortunate that we have Allah's message that we have a path to achieving faith, to finding him. But what of those who came before his message was revealed? What of those who came before the message of any religion 
before Islam, before Christianity, before Judaism was revealed. Were these people denied access to a pathway to faith? I think not. I believe that the yearning to find our faith is inherent in us. It is in our very DNA. Even for the person who has no religion or no formal path to worship, Allah has provided a means that if utilized appropriately and to its fullest extent, it will lead to him. I am referring to our intellect, our common sense and ability to reason. Allah's revelations came through his prophets and his scriptures for sure. But Allah's revelations also come to us through our own intellect, common sense and power of reasoning. If that were not the case, Hazrat Ibrahim salam, would not have been the father of the three great monotheistic faiths. Hazrat Ibrahim is referred to in the Quran no less than eight times as Hanif. The word Hanif means monotheist, the opposite of one who worships idols. It is ironic that the designation has been bestowed on, on Hazrat Ibrahim salam, because he was born into a family of idol worshippers. And his father, in fact, made the very idols that were worshipped. So if anything, he should have been an idol worshiper. But for Hazrat Ibrahim salam, even as a child, the worship of idols went against his intellect, his reasoning. How could a person make a statue and then worship what he had made? How could these man-made objects that did not eat, drink, or talk, and that could not even turn themselves right side up if someone turned them upside down? How could people believe that such statues could harm or benefit them. The intellect, the reasoning that was in his DNA, that was inherent within him, rejected this outrageous motion, notion. Yet, inherent within him was the belief that there was something greater than himself, greater than everything around him. His reason, what he saw around him, told him that there was something so great, so magnificent, so Un, unimaginable, so unquantifiable that brought the universe into existence. So he set out in search for the source of all creation. Now, I'll take you on a small digression along the scenic tour. On one historic occasion, to prove his point, Hazrat Ibrahim salam stayed behind in the temple while the others attended a pagan feast. Alone with the idols, he destroyed all except the largest one. When confronted by the community with his deeds, what have you done, Ibrahim? He claimed that the largest idol was the one who wreaked the destruction, since he was the only one left standing. Even those who worshipped the idols knew that this could not happen, that no idol had the power to do anything. It flew against common sense. So they rejected Hazrat Ibrahim salam's explanation and set out to punish him. If we have time later, and if anyone is interested, I will narrate the story of how the community tried to punish him and what the outcome was. But for our purposes, here's the thing. We become so entrenched in our practices that we turn away from the truth, even when it stares us in the face. Even while acknowledging that the largest idol could not possibly have destroyed all the others, the people of the community refused to give up their practice of idol worship. See the crucial difference between Hazrat Ibrahim salam, and the other members of his community was that when his reason led him to the truth, he did not look away as many of us are sometimes tempted to do in order to conform in order to not rock the boat. Having rejected idol worship, Hazrat Ibrahim salam, began his spiritual journey, which is so lyrically narrated in Surah Al-Anam, chapter 6, ayat 76 to 79. Then, when the night outspread over him, he beheld a star and said, This is my Lord. 
But when it went down, he said, I do not love the things that go down. Then when he beheld the moon rising, he said, this is my Lord. But when it went down, he said, would that my Lord, if it were, if it were not my Lord that did not guide me, I surely would have become among the people who have gone astray. Then when he beheld the sun rising, he said, this is my Lord, this is the greatest of all. Then when it went down, he said, O oh, my people, most certainly I am free of those whom you associate with Allah and his divinity. Behold, I have turned my face in exclusive devotion to the one who originated the heavens and the earth. I am certainly not one of those who associate others with Allah in his divinity. As an aside, I don't know if you are familiar with this, mostly you must be. The word Allah is a compound word. It is a combination of Al, which is the definite article, and La, which is God. So in Arabic, Allah means the God, the God that excludes any other God. Scholars have discussed and disputed whether Hazrat Ibrahim salam, really believed that the stars, moon, and sun were God, or whether he made these declarations to support an argument that the divine creator was greater than the stars, the moon, and the sun. I have found no clear-cut argument or explanation to support one side or the other. Be that as it may, what I do find in these verses is an account of a spiritual journey that was guided by reasoning and intellect, something that Allah has given to all of us. Hazrat Ibrahim salam, declares that he has turned his face in exclusive devotion to the one who originated the heavens and earth. He declares that he worships Allah and only Allah. Having recognized that Allah is the originator of the heavens and earth, by logical reasoning, Hazrat Ibrahim salam, gives not only his devotion, but also his submission to Allah. Because when you exist only because Allah originated you, created you, how can you not submit to him? Were it not for Allah, you would not exist. So it is entirely logical to submit to him. And how completely and beautifully does Hazrat Ibrahim salam, submit as Surah Baqarah chapter two, ayat 131 says, Behold, his Lord said to him, submit. He said, I submit to the Lord and cherisher of the universe. I have a particular reason for presenting this ayat in Arabic along with the English. The reason is that I want to draw your attention to the word rab. Again, a small word, but loaded, weighted with so much meaning. Rab means Lord. It means master. It means the supreme one in whose hands is the command and dominion of the universe. It means the one deserving of obedience. But Rab also means the one who cherishes, the one who nurtures, the one who takes care of you. So even if Allah is the Lord, the master, the supreme one who may seem so distant, who may seem so unapproachable, he is not distant, he is not approachable. He is the one, he is personal to you. He is the one who nurtures you, who nourishes you, who cherishes you. He is your nourisher, your cherisher. He is closer to you than your jugular vein. He is sufficient for you. Hazrat Ibrahim salam, recognizes that Allah is all of this. So he says, I submit to the Lord and cherisher of the universe, to Rabbul Alameen. Wow, it sounds so simple, even seductive. Submit yourself to Allah and let go. How stress-free our lives would be if we could do that. Submission is a corollary to faith. They go hand in hand. 
When you are ill and you go to a doctor, you go with the faith that the doctor will fix whatever is wrong with you. And you will submit to whatever course of treatment he or she prescribes. If you are told to exercise, you will exercise. If you are told to restrict your diet, you will restrict your diet. If you are told to take certain medications, you will take those medications. If you have faith in the doctor's ability to cure you, you will submit. So when we can put our faith in and submit to a physician who is only human, why do we find it so difficult to put our faith in and submit to the one who created the human physician? See, when it comes to submitting to Allah, the problem is we cannot let go. We cannot give up our illusion of control. Not so with Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah commands him to submit and he says, I submit to the Lord and cherisher of the universe. He does not question, what is it that I am submitting to? What will happen if I submit? Will I subject myself to hardship and suffering if I submit? He asks no questions. He simply says, I submit. Our faith is complete only when we can tell ourselves, I submit to Allah. It does not matter what happens. Allah is sufficient for me. Hazrat Ibrahim salam, knew that even if he does fall off the precipice, Allah will allow him to grow wings and teach him to fly. There are many examples in the Quran of Hazrat Ibrahim salam's submission to Allah. The one that is given the most prominence is the narrative of Hazrat Ibrahim salam, being told to sacrifice his only son. And without hesitation, he prepares to do so. He is commanded to submit and he submits. No hesitation, no second thought, no question asked. But long before Hazrat Ibrahim salam, submitted to the command to sacrifice his son, Hazrat Ismail salam, a sacrifice that we commemorate to this day when we celebrate Eid al Adha, there was another command to submit, which Hazrat Ibrahim salam, also obeyed without hesitation. Let's talk about the birth of Hazrat, Islai, is, of Hazrat Ismail salam. Hazrat Ismail salam, was born to Hazrat Ibrahim salam, and his second wife, Hazrat Hajra, in Canaan. An infant away from Canaan to a location in the middle of the desert, a location which we now know as Mecca, and to leave them there. I looked up where Canaan was located, and according to Google, yes, wonderful Google, Canaan was the territory known as the Southern Levant, which today encompasses Israel, the West Bank and Gaza, Jordan, and the Southern portion of Syria. So the distance from Canaan to Mecca would have been approximately 1400 kilometers or around 900 miles. Today, in this day and age, by car, it takes nearly 15 hours to make this trip. In the time of Hazrat Ibrahim salam, when a person could travel at the most 25 miles in a day, it would have taken over a month to complete the journey. I cannot even begin to comprehend the completeness of Hazrat Ibrahim salam's faith and submission that on Allah's command, he takes his wife and infant son on an arduous, month-long journey to the middle of the desert only to leave them there in the middle of nowhere with no one around with only enough dates and water for mother and infant to suffice for two days only two days by many accounts Hazrat Ibrahim salam, was well over 80 years old when this child was born how he must have longed to be a father in all those years. 
how joyful he must have been to have to have been granted a child in his old age. Is there any doubt that the child was precious and loved dearly? Is there any doubt that the father in him was heartbroken at having to obey Allah's terrible command? Is there any doubt that the father in him resisted obeying the command? But whatever his frame of mind, whatever his emotions, Hazrat Ibrahim salam, does submit without question, without hesitation. We are given a brief insight into how difficult this act of submission must have been for Hazrat Ibrahim salam, because we are told in various accounts that after reaching Mecca, he helps the mother and infant child dismount and without saying a word, without looking at them, he starts walking away. Hazrat Hajra hurries after him, bewildered. Where are you going, Ibrahim, leaving us in this barren valley? Hazrat Ibrahim salam, cannot bring himself to answer her. He cannot bring himself to face her. He keeps his back turned, his head bowed, and just continues walking away. And Hazrat Hajra continues to hurry after him, asking him the same question over and over again. Where are you going, Ibrahim, leaving us in this barren valley? And he continues to maintain his silence. Finally, she asks him, did Allah command you to do so? And then, still with his back turned, still with his head bowed, still unable to face her, he replies quietly, Yes, we have seen up until this point, the, uh, we have seen how faith leads to submission, but yet there is another attribute that emanates from faith. That attribute is courage. It takes courage to do the right thing, even though your heart is breaking. As difficult as it may be to take hardship and suffering upon yourself, and to sacrifice your own well-being. It would be unthinkable for a parent to even consider jeopardizing their child's life. It is faith that provides this courage to submit. So far, I have addressed the faith, submission, and courage of Hazrat Ibrahim salam. But there is also another who has demonstrated unshakable faith, complete submission, and almost superhuman courage. I am referring to Hazrat Hajra. I will ask you to recall that when she is left behind in the desert, Hazrat Hajra hurries after her husband and questions why she and her infant are being abandoned in the barren valley. She continues to ask this question until her husband confirms that he is acting upon the command of Allah. And at that point, she no longer questions and submits to Allah's will. Was Hazrat Hajra terrified? I'm sure she was. Did she know what her outcome would be? We know she did not, but she submitted. Think of the courage it must have taken her not to run after Hazrat Ibrahim salam, and beg him not to leave her and her infant son behind. Think of the courage it must have taken for her to say, if this is Allah's will, so be it. Faith, submission, and courage, three parts of a whole, believing that you will not fall. But even if you do, you will grow wings and learn to fly. You are most likely familiar with how the story ends. After her provisions run out and her infant son is dying from dehydration, the mother runs to the hill of Safa in search of water. Not finding it, she runs to the hill of Marwa. She does not find it there either. In desperation, she keeps running, running, running from one hill to another, seven times, seven times in all until the angel Jibreel appears and shows her a spot to dig. She digs and lo and behold, the spring of Zamzam gushes forth, cool, pure, sweet, 
life-saving water. I don't know how old Hazrat Hajra was at the time, and I was not able to find any reference to her age. But my guess is that being a first time mother, she must have been young. My guess is that she must also have lived a sheltered life in Hazrat Ibrahim Salam's household. How does one so young and so sheltered find the courage to survive all alone in a barren valley with an infant to care for unless they have unshakable faith to support them? The spring of Zamzam, a testament to Hazrat Hajra's faith, has provided cool, pure, and sweet water through the millennia to this day. The faith, submission, and courage of Hazrat Hajra are also commemorated to this very day in the ritual of Hajj, where pilgrims run seven times between the hills of Safa and Marwa. I do realize that it would be unrealistic for me to expect that we can be like Hazrat Ibrahim salam in our faith, submission, and courage. After all, he was a prophet, one of Allah's chosen. But remember, Allah has told us that his prophets were also ordinary human beings. Therefore, we can at least aspire to follow his footsteps. And Hazrat Hajra, she was not a prophet, but her faith, submission, and courage stood up to Allah's trial. We can aspire to be like her. She can be our role model. In those moments when our faith is shaken, when we begin to doubt if Allah hears us, all we have to do is move our hand up to our neck and feel our jugular vein. Let us feel Allah in the pulsating vein under our fingers. Let us feel him in the blood that courses through our veins and our arteries. Let us feel him in our heart that plumps our pumps, in our heart that pumps our blood. Let us feel him deep, deep within ourselves as he listens to the whisper of our soul. Let us feel him, let us feel him, let us feel him, and we will know how close Allah, our creator, our originator, our Lord, our cherisher is to us. Let us feel him so that we can learn to fly on the wings of faith. I thank my Rabb for the opportunity to speak before you today. I thank him for the words that he has given me today. And I seek forgiveness and forbearance from him for any shortcomings in my presentation today. Now, if anyone has any questions or answers, please let's hear from you. Any questions? Beautifully done. Mashallah, mashallah. Please come back again. Will do, will do. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah. That was a perfect word. What a beautiful khutbah. Um, I had one quick question for you. Yes. When you talk about the idols, mm -hmm. how does that how does that compare to the Hindu faith and Hindu practices of puja? Okay, I'm glad you asked the question because growing up in India, I am familiar with the Hindu faith. And I will tell you this, in its purest form, Hinduism is a monotheistic faith. There is the belief in one supreme creator, one divine originator, and he's called Paramatma. And in fact, there is a word for him. It's called Nirgun. Nirgun means one who cannot be qualified. Which is, very, which is very close to how we say Allah is. The, the, the statues that people worship in puja, those are not simply statues that people made and got to the mandir. There is a whole process that goes before the statues are placed in the mandir. And again, the, the names of the statues 
are the names of the different manifestations, the different attributes of Allah, just as we have the 99 names of Allah, it is as though each attribute were given a form so that people could see it. And before the statues are brought into a temple, when a statue is brought into a temple, there's a special service called Pran Pratista Puja, which means that they are invoking the spirit of Allah to come and reside in that statue. So when they bow be before that statue, they're not be bowing before a piece made of clay, but they're bowing to the spirit that they believe is contained in that statue. Uh, does that answer your question, Shabana? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's just, just something that I'm curious. My, you know, my husband is Hindu, as you know. Yes. Uh, so no, I know that. Yeah. I just love um, hearing more context around ar around that, and I think did you said it's a monotheistic religion, right? Did, yes, did and it's you, very yeah. essence. Yes, it is. Yeah, I, so, I believe it is. Yes, absolutely. I really because, appreciate the clear. Yeah, I appreciate your clarification. I'm, oh, go ahead. No, because I I have over the years listened to many lectures by many, many learned Hindu Swami, Swami Chinmayananda, Chinmayananda, Swami Dayananda. And when they talk about uh, the, the Supreme Creator, it, I, some, I would think that somebody is reading from the Quran. Yeah. No, I appreciate the clarification because I know sometimes there's a lot of misconceptions out there. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing. No. Thank you, Shabana. And thank you. I love you, sweetie. Is there any questions, any more questions, any answers? If you have answers for me, I would love them. I think there's a Namila. Go ahead. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum um, Asalaam. Yeah, this was a very beautiful khutbah. Um, I, you know, I, I had two questions. Mm -hmm. one, uh, uh, one was about the, the, you were said that you might just say that story, uh, what happens in the story that you were saying earlier. About okay, the, about the punishment? Yeah. And the second was like a good way to reach out to you because I have, I'm doing work on religion and spirituality and faith mm -hmm. in my work. So I just wanted to see if there's any way to reach out to you. Absolutely. Anytime Shabana has my number, she can give it to you. Uh, Brother Osama has my number, he can give it to you. So if you want to hear the story, it's beautiful. And again, it's a question, it, it, it illustrates Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam's submission. So when he destroyed their precious idols, the people of the community, they said we have to punish him, including Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam's father, who by that time disowned his son. So they dug a huge pit, a huge giant pit, and in that pit they lit a fire. And they said, we will burn Ibrahim in this fire. So they placed Ibrahim salam in the fire. And at that point, Jibril appears before him and says, can I do anything for you? And I'm choking up because this is the strength. This is the completeness of Hazrat Ibrahim salam's submission and faith. He says to Jibreel, no, I don't need anything from you. If it's Allah's will, I am fine. And of course, Allah does not allow Hazrat Ibrahim salam to burn. He cools the fire. And then Hazrat Ibrahim salam walks away from the community. Any other questions? So um, if there are no more questions, I will end this khutbah. And I thank you very, very much for giving me your time today. And uh, God bless you. And may you continue to flourish. Allah is. <laughs>